Hello and welcome to Coronanomics, brought to you by Econ Films. This week, coronavirus in the markets. Countries around the world are in the midst of the worst ever peacetime recession, with mass unemployment and warnings that global trade could fall by a third this year. In the developed world, stock markets collapsed in February, yet since the end of March they've shown a remarkable recovery. So what's going on? Are investors pricing in a vaccine breakthrough or betting on a V-shaped global recovery? Some argue the disconnect between financial markets and the real economy won't last, that markets have much further to fall. So who's right and what are the implications for the rest of us? This week we're joined by Lord Jim O'Neill, a former UK Treasury Minister and Chair of Goldman Sachs Asset Management, where he famously coined the term BRICS. He's currently Chair of the Chatham House Think Tank. We're also joined by Willem Boiter, a visiting professor at Columbia University in New York, a former chief economist at Citigroup and a founding member of the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee. First of all, why is there such a disconnect between what's going on in financial markets and what's going on in the real economy? The green line here shows the US stock market since February. In mid-March, the people signing on for welfare starts to soar. At the same time, stock market starts to rise. Now it's technically in a bull market, up 20% from its lows. Willem, do you feel that you can make a case for rational markets here, or do you think maybe we're due a correction? The S&P index is not a measure of profits current in the US uh, this year. It's a global index, and it is quite unrepresentative. Uh, in terms of the overweight of tech stocks and medical stocks, health stocks. So I can easily tell a story that markets uh, are nowhere near as bonkers as they look. I'm often happy to sort of describe what markets uh, are doing as being, being completely mad. If the recent news on vaccines turns out to be uh, a great hope that, that fails, then I suspect we will have a further big drop and it will really hurt a lot of emerging markets. But if what the news we've seen in the past fortnight about vaccines turns out to be right, I think many markets will strengthen a lot further, including many emerging markets, where there is huge fear that is going to devastate them all. But the biggest devastation here has been confined to North America and, and, and Europe, with the exception of Brazil and Russia, so far. I personally uh, don't believe that uh, a vaccine by the end of the year or early next year is terribly likely, but I'm speaking for, uh, for a position of profound ignorance, which seems to be a defining characteristic of this crisis. Epidemiologists don't seem to be knowing you know, what's going to happen next, so economists are very unlikely to be terribly confident. And speaking of unusual market behaviour, let's have a look at what happened to oil futures last month. Prices slumped from $60 a barrel at the start of the year right down into negative territory on the 20th of April. Jim, is the story behind this simply that demand for oil crashed because the world went into lockdown, or is there more to it? The dilemma that oil has had is, of course, this staggering collapse of the world economy and therefore a huge collapse in oil demand. But, but it came on top of the desire uh, to do something serious about climate change. So uh, you, had a, you had the perfect storm of everything that could go wrong for oil all coinciding. So Willem, what impact do you think the UK and the US going negative in their interest rates would have on equity and bond markets? If we don't take measures to lower the, you know, the floor, the effective lower bound, on interest rates, then they can't cut the policy rate much below minus 75 basis points, and that will be small potatoes. If we do uh, what needs to be done to uh, really lower or preferably abolish the effective lower bound on interest rates so that we can cut um, the nominal interest rates, the policy rate to minus three, four, or five percent, then central banks will have a serious symmetric additional instrument at their disposal. You used to be a minister at the Treasury, Jim. How, how do you think it would be received inside the Treasury, that sort of thinking? Uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, it, would, uh, it would scare Treasury officials and, and certainly 
those that move between the bank and the treasury uh, tend to be very cautious by nature. And, and I do suspect there are some people around the treasury uh, that, that, that are probably thinking about things like this. They're thinking that, in fact, we might end up with inflation as a result of all this policy stimulus. But it, it's something that I, I think uh, is much more worthy of consideration than I would have thought a few years ago. I think that um, simply because they will need more instruments to support economic activity, they will look at negative interest rates. I myself am not a supporter of uh, nominal uh, income or nominal GDP targeting, uh, basically because nominal GDP has no welfare dimension. Nobody cares about it intrinsically. Inflation matters and real GDP matters. Then I would uh, liberate uh, the bank from this artificial constraint on its ability to set interstate negatively as easily as uh, set them positively.